you'll also notice that uh, there's other stuff here that may not be so obvious, like IOMKL versus FOSS. So what these are are tool chains. Uh, the FOSS tool, tool chain is free open source software, and the IOMKL is the other common one, and that's the uh, Intel Math Kernel Library uh, tool chain. So tool chains down here, this is a better description. The uh, free open source software tool chain uh, that some of these packages are compiled with are simply using the GNU compiler collection. And that's things like GCC. So this is the uh, free GCC compiler, but also this tool chain includes other things that are commonly used with uh, a compiler. And in this case, it's including most everything that's needed for running optimal, uh, optimized and parallel codes. In other words, open MPI package to do MPI support for parallelization. Open BLOS uh, to uh, load the BLOS library uh, for optimized, uh, low level optimized routines. LawPack is a linear algebra package, an FFT pack, and a scalable uh, version of LawPack. So if you do compile something for yourself, you can do a module load of FOSS and get all these packages for yourself. If you do a module load of an individual module, it may load these uh, as a dependency. If we go down here, the other tool chain that I mentioned, the other main one is the Intel one. This is the Intel cluster tool chain. And so that would have for example, for the Intel compiler, it would have ICC, the Intel version of the C compiler, as well as C++ and Fortran compilers. Then it has the Intel math kernel library. And this kind of includes a lot of the uh, individual libraries that were in the FOSS uh, tool chain. So that includes BLOSS, and that includes LawPack, FFTs, etc. So that's all lumped together in the math kernel library. And then in addition, this also includes OpenMPI. So those are the two main tool chains that you have to be aware of. If you compile your own code, uh, both these can be used to compile code optimally. Uh, if the directions for compiling your code use one or the other, I would stick with that. Uh, just because that means it's more likely that the developers of that code tested it uh, on those compiler chains. Uh, but otherwise, a good code should be compiled, compilable by either of these tool chains. You have variations on these tool chains, like FOSS CUDA is the FOSS tool chain, but it has CUDA, which is what it, you need to uh, compile uh, for support for the NVIDIA GPU cards. So if you're trying to get your application to accelerate with GPU cards, if it's programmed to do that, you need to include the uh, support for the CUDA library. So that's all I really want to go through on tool chains. Let's spend a little bit more time on modules. So again, uh, Let's look at one module here. I'm gonna start by doing a module purge. So I start with a blank slate, and then I'm gonna do a module uh, avail. Then I'm gonna pipe that, do a grep minus I for case insensitive search. And I'm gonna look for the package called VASP. This is a uh, atomistic package uh, that's used uh, by chemists and physicists to simulate uh, small numbers of atoms in a quantum mechanical way. And what you see off to the right is there are two versions here. Uh, one is VASP, they're both version 5.4.4. Uh, this version of VASP, VASP that I've highlighted is compiled with the FOSS tool chain, the free open source software tool chain. And then the next thing it says is 
2018A, so that gives you an idea of uh, what uh, time frame the, uh, uh, the tool chain was used. So the 2018 version of the GNU tool chain. And then this, the rest here, dimer beef, sol, uh, salvation, are some packages that were compiled into it. So if you want to know more about it, you can do a module spider. And then I'm going to paste that in. And module spider will give you a better description of what the package is. Uh, it says VAST is the Vienna Ab Initio simulation package and tells you a lot of quantum mechanical, molecular dynamics, first principle stuff. But it also, uh, uh, so yeah, it also gives you a website where you can go for more information, for example, down here. So module spider is a good way of getting a uh, more verbal description of a package. And you can actually do better than this. I showed you there were two versions of it. So if we just do a module uh, spider of VASP itself, what that's going to show is both versions that are available. So again, module spider is just a, a good way of searching for a specific package and getting more information about what versions are available. Uh, now up here, you'll also notice that on the right side here is a D. That means that's the default version. Uh, if you want to be explicit, you'll, you can do a module load of the entire package, but if you just do a module load of VASP, it'll choose the, def the default one. This other version here is FOSS and CUDA, so that's the GPU enabled version. So again, we did a module purge. So if I do a module list, it's going to tell me I have no modules loaded. If I do a module load, and this time we're going to do VASP, and then a module list. There's actually 17 modules loaded now. So that's the nice thing about modules is that it not only loads what you're looking for, it loads all the dependencies. So in this case, number 17 here is the actual package uh, and it tells you the version number and everything that we went over before. But it also tells you that it loaded the beef uh, library. And again, uh, that's one of the uh, uh, dependencies here, one of the packages that was compiled in to this version was the beef library. So it tells you exactly that it loaded it in and what version number. Here's where it loaded in the FOSS tool chain and it said that's from 2018. And again, with the FOSS tool chain, here are some of these other packages that are loaded in, Scalapack, an FFT library, here's the BLOSS library, here's the OpenMPI library to give the parallelization, and a lot of other things. This is the core GCC library. So the nice thing about this is that you don't really have to know these things. Uh, if you want to use VASP, you just have to know to do the module load of VASP, and it even sets up the uh, path to, to the VASP executable. Now, I know that the, math S, math, the VASP executable is called VASP standard, for example. So if I do that, it shows me right where the uh, executable is. And if I want to run this, I can do my MPI run and uh, give it the number of processors and etc. Now I don't have this set up to uh, do a run. But uh, again, when you load a module, it loads the executable, it sets up the path, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a very nice 
uh, way of managing software packages for a cluster like this. So again, uh, if there is a section on an installing your own software, uh, and again, if you find yourself in need of a software package that isn't in our module list, then uh, uh, you are responsible for doing that but with our help. And uh, if it is something that you think that others might uh, be interested in, let us know and we can see if it's in what we call the easy build. Easy build is the uh, list of recipes for how to build these modules. And so that's a, that's a time when uh, we'd go to Adam and say, well, you know, is this in the easy build list? Is this something we should build for the entire cluster and put it in a module? So any questions about modules or tool chains at this point? Modules and tool chains are something you'll find on most of uh, the larger supercomputing centers around. So it is just a convenient way of managing the installed software. Yeah. If you want it to not be there, okay. Yeah, the module purge will get rid of all your modules. I will show you one other thing too. On my base directory, I have a an example of uh, a script where I run VASP. And one thing that I do in my scripts is I always start by doing a module purge. So I know I'm starting from a blank slate. Then I do a module load of the specific version that I'm running and I do a module list. That means that every time you run this, it'll put in your output file a listing of exactly what you did. This is very useful if you contact us because we know exactly what version you're running and that saves us the time of asking. Uh, this is not a necessity. If you do a module load of VASP, for example, and then submit a job, the job will know where the VASP executable is because it takes that from the environment before you submitted your job. But there won't be a list of that in the, in the uh, script that you're submitting uh, and unless you do a module list in your script, it won't be in your output. So putting a module purge and then the explicit module load like this in your script is a good idea because it saves one communication step with us if you do run into problems. Yeah. Yeah, because with, yeah, with VASP, there's only the two versions right now, but we've gone through old ones. Right now, there's deprecated versions that a few people are using, et cetera. And if someone says, I have a problem with VASP, our first uh, question is, well, you have to tell me what version of VASP you're using. So doing it in this way is uh, good for, for several reasons. Any other questions on modules or tool chains before we move on? Okay, I think you're up, Kyle. Let me, uh, I have to unshare, I think.
Yeah, I'm having a little trouble with that. Yeah, I'm not even seeing what this is. Uh, this is, back here is your stuff. Well, um, not, mine, mine doesn't show the center box. Right, because so. it's showing what's on the teeth. It's about showing what's on the teeth in there. Um, so if you go up to the top, uh, maybe you can zoom button there. Left. Is there? Yeah. Let's say, uh, There we go. And now, assuming I don't catch the chair again like I had, we're going to go a few, a few, through a few things on copying files into and out of Beocat. Um, we've already gone through the, the GUI uh, piece with Mobile Xterm and FileZilla, so I'm going to kind of skip that piece of it. Uh, we have some new software installed. We've had it for a while, but we've got some enhanced versions uh, for running through Globus, and that's a high-speed data transfer service. So I'm going to share my screen, and I've never done this on Windows before, and we don't have it installed, so this ought to make it interesting. So I'm actually going to pull my stuff around here so I can kind of look at the screen. We have to do quite a bit of this at the same time here. Globus is a very high-speed data transfer service. Um, it's really meant for... Uh, moving from one data center to another. So if you were using some Exceed resources, if you're going out to some of the big national supercomputers, they would all have the Globus installed. It also works for copying to your own, uh, from your own laptop or desktop. Um, and we have two of them. And let me actually pull up here our support pages because it kind of gives a diagram of how things are, are uh, installed here because it'll make sense what I'm talking about here. A little more if you can actually see a picture. Support. Okay, okay. Okay. I have a page here. I'm just going to go straight to. Come on. I hate this mouse. Focus. I have a page called the Globus right here. Okay, so we have two data transfer nodes or DTNs. This, this picture right here, see if I can blow this up big enough that you can uh, open a new tab. There we are. That's now getting to be big enough we can see what's going on here. Come on. Be nice if it saw my mouse clicks. There we are. Minimize this. No. Anyway. All right. So what we have here, this is just a quick block diagram of, of how the university connects to Beocat and why you should pick one or the over the other. So Canran, that's our internet service provider, among other things, but that's Canren is where we get our internet service from for the whole campus and for Beocat. The entire campus gets a 20 gigabit connection to the university. So everything you guys are doing, every, all the internet stuff you do is all going through this campus firewall at 20 gigabits per second. We have a separate connection also through Canren at 100 gigabits per section that just goes down to the Fiona node. The Fiona is that's fast input output network appliance if I remember right. There's a name why it's called Fiona. Um, but that connects straight to the Beocat network. So if you're on camp, if you're off campus, say transferring to one of those big data centers, data trip back and forth, it makes a whole lot of sense that you'll want to transfer to from Fiona because that bypasses all the campus network stuff, the campus firewall, the campus, everything else, and it's a faster connection on top of that. However, if you're over here on campus, let's say that you're in Throckmorton, then to go to the Fiona, you would have to go outside of K-State's network through the campus firewall, back to Kenren, 
outside, back to Canran, back to the Fiona, that doesn't make any sense at all. You'd want to go on the one that's on campus, even though it's a little bit slower, 40 gigabits per second, a little slower, still pretty good speeds, right? So uh, these, these buildings are all connected to 10 gigabits per second. There's some campus, some buildings on campus that aren't quite that fast, uh, but most of them are uh, one or 10, 10 gigabits per second. So if you're in one of these places, you'll want to use the on-campus, the DTN, well, just, it just labeled DTN, that was the first one we had. It does still go through the BayoCat firewall, however, it's very fast and you're still gonna end up having to go through firewalls anyway. So if you're on campus, you're gonna wanna use the DTN. If you're off campus, you're gonna wanna use the Fiona. Generally speaking, now, if you already have all your stuff set up to use the on-campus and you're transferring a small file, by small I mean, you know, a couple megabytes, something like that, the time it takes to set it all up is gonna dwarf the amount of time that it takes to transfer the file. So if it's only gonna take you a couple minutes anyway, don't worry about it, just go ahead and use this. Just, but if you're using large data sets, if you're transferring a couple hundred gigabytes or terabytes, which we have people doing that, data sets that size, if we're doing that, you probably wanna to go to Fiona. Uh, if you're off campus, it'll be worth that time extra spent, that extra time you spend to set it up. And this is what I'm gonna show, I'm gonna demonstrate the, uh, using Globus, and you're gonna see that it takes a little while to set it up. Once it goes, it's extremely fast. It's also meant to be extremely resilient. Uh, we have, uh, we're, there are places transferring files at this 100 gigabits per second across the entire nation between these big data centers. New batteries help? Mine got your different mouse. Different mouse, okay. So, transfer to Globus. First of all, we're gonna start through a web browser. And you're gonna to go to globus.org. Oh, yay, I have Logitech Options software. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it is. All right, and you can't see because I'm, because it's got the little Zoom box right up here, but there's the login button right here. Okay, this is the first page you get to. It's asking to log in to somewhere, and, and it doesn't say where, it, since I've never been on this computer before, if I say look up my organization, you'll see there are a whole lot of them out there. These are all the sites that use Globus. Um, in our case, we're gonna be Kansas State University, so I'm gonna start typing Kansas until we see that there's a very small list now and I can choose Kansas State University. And I continue, and now it's gonna take us back to K-State's single sign-on page. Again, I don't have my password manager here. Gotta look this up. And my particular account is duo enabled, so I'm getting this onto my phone now. I'm approving this. If you're not, if you're not using duo, then you, it'll skip that step. And now I'm in the file manager, but it doesn't say that I have anything going on. So the first place I wanna go is I wanna go to endpoints. On the left here. Now this one happens to remember the last, last few places that I've been. So we're not gonna worry about that right now. I'm going to pretend like I don't see anything down here. I'm going to go up to the top to search all endpoints. And here I'm going to start typing Bayocat. It's a little bit different. The first one is Kansas State. This one is Bayocat. And you'll see that I have two options when I go into Bayocat. The first one is the on-campus DTN. The second one is the Fiona. That's the one that's outside the campus firewall. So I'm going to click there on the on-campus one first. We'll demonstrate this one. And it tells me I have no active transfer credentials. So it timed out basically since the last time I've used it, which is not surprising since it's been a few days. So what I want to do is I want to activate that. And again, it's going to ask me for my username and password. 
this is actually talking to Baocat itself. And as you know, if you're and when you log into Baocat, even if you are Duo enabled, it doesn't do this. That's not through the campus sign on. This is basically the equivalent of logging in there. So even though we're using EID credentials, it has no way of knowing that we're that it's actually the same. So I'm having to put my password in again. And there it tells me it, the active certificate expires in a day. So it gives me one day to, to transfer files that it, before it times it out. And if I'm getting close to the end, I can go to the same page and I can say extend activation. Now I want to open that in the file manager. And if you look, you'll see the same things here that I had. No, don't save my password. Thanks. You'll see the files that I had here two days ago. There's my out files from uh, from uh, the, the demonstration that I ran. We'll take one of those and I can delete it for instance. It takes a minute to submit that job because everything is going through the Globus service. So this is not as fast as through uh, mobile Xterm or FileZilla or one of those kind of things. It'll, it'll take a few seconds usually just get started, uh, maybe up to a minute to get started. Once it does it, then we're there. There is the refresh button here. And now you can see I only have two of the files left. So that doesn't, that's all right for managing files there, but we want to do more than that. We want to transfer files to and from there. So this computer I'm on here, I need to, uh, I, I want to transfer files there. So I'm going to go back to endpoints here. And I want to make my own endpoint. Come on, where's a file manager? What things happen strange when you get when you make a screen large here? So I lose track of where I am. There we are, endpoint. Is this where it is? Yes, little plus up in the corner. Here's the kind of endpoint I want to add. I want to add a Globus Connect personal. So I'm going to say this is the 3099 uh, room display. Just a friendly name that I can, I can use to, to uh, talk back and forth here. Ask the identity. Yes, I'm using Kyle Hudson. And I'm going to download this for Windows. Like I said, I've never even done a Windows one before. So we'll see how good I am at faking my way through it. Do I want to allow this app to make changes? Yes. I wonder if it'll let me install software. Apparently, okay. Okay, now it wants the setup key. So I have to come back here, I have to generate a setup key. And I'm going to copy that, put it back in here, and OK. Do you want to use Globus to access your documents? Uh, yeah, I want to, my, my, my documents here are all in the U drive, so I'm going to change that. So uh, we're going to make that writable. We're going to add my desktop, users, and me, and desktop, and I want to add my U drive, which is computer science department, U drive is for personal stuff, so. Chosen all that. All right, save. Okay, Globus Connect Personal is now running in the background. This is good. So now we go to endpoints. Administered by me. Now I have the 3099 room display. 
So I can open that in the file manager. Ah, this silly thing, the screen is too small to do what I want it to do. Okay, let's see if it lets me do this here. No. Here we're seeing my files over here, but I want to transfer them to Beocat. Let me see if I make my screen smaller here, if this lets, let me do this right. Transfer or sync to. There we are. Now it's got a place over here. So I have my computer over here, select, a locate, select over here, the on-campus DTN. And now I have my files from my desktop here. I have my files for um, uh, Beocat over here. I can do things like drag and drop files this way. As you can see, it doesn't actually do it immediately. It tells you it created a task. And you can actually tell it to, in your, in your personal options, it can actually send me an email to tell me that, hey, this started, hey, this finished. If you're dealing with large uh, data sets, that can be really convenient. The nice thing also is, is that say this uh, is, is running in this room, I could walk away, I wanna transfer a few gigabytes. I could walk away from this room, be logged out, as long as that Globus Connect personal server is running it'll still continue to transfer files in the background. That's also, uh, you can initiate from here, like I said, from one data center to another. So I have credentials, as of today, at University of South Dakota, I'm gonna go do some work there in a couple of weeks. So uh, I can transfer files to and from South Dakota and Beocat all, all through this interface. We can uh, sync folders between them, uh, download, upload, uh, I can copy files the other way too, drag and drop that way. Very similar to a file manager. Like I said, the, the difference you'll notice is that it doesn't start immediately. It starts usually 10, 15 seconds, somewhere in that range, maybe up to a minute. Um, but once it gets going, it's very fast. So that's the on-campus DTN. Oh, one other thing. Say you wanna share files with people here too. So over here, I have a shared files folder. I can, let me see if I can make my screen smaller again here. There we are. Ah, oh, I deleted all my files out of there. That's silly. Uh, let's see, do I have anything here? I think I zoom folder. Yeah, there we are. So let's go into my shared files. I'll put this. Drag. There we are over there. Refresh, there it is, okay. Now the other thing, there we are, couldn't see everything I needed to see on the screen at once. Okay, so now on this endpoint, I can go to the DTN and you, there is an option here called shares. This is how I'm gonna fi share files with people. Again, this is on the on-campus DTN, so I probably wanna, you can share it with people off campus too, but this is primarily on this, on this node, you're gonna be wanting to do the ones with somebody on campus. The path is, I can browse out here and say, my shared files, I want to select that. Uh, display name, Kyle's demo shared files. And I create that share. Now, by default, right now, I have read and write access 
to that folder. But let's say I want to share this with somebody. I want to share that. The first thing it's going to say is the path. So it's it already it by default it's already in the shared files. I can submit I can do this by username or email. So let's say Dave over there. Dave Turner at ksu.edu. And I want him to have write permission. Add him and add permission. So now Dave also has write permission to that same folder that I do. Uh, I can also do all users. So anybody in the world that goes and searches for it, not necessarily just a K-State, I can say, I can go ahead and, and add permission and give them read access. I could also give them write access. Don't do that. Don't give the entire world write access. Remember, you're in charge of what's in your folder. So don't do that. So is anybody logged into Globus already now here in, in this room? Are you, is anybody here already logged into Globus? You are? You are, you're trying to? Let's see if you can see my files here. Are you logged in? Uh, yeah. The, the, per, oh, the personal? Yeah. You don't necessarily have to have the personal in order to do that. Oh, I guess you do because you have to transfer it back to your machine. There, okay, on a Mac, I've, what I, where it says that generate that setup key, there's a, and under preferences, go in and say delete and set, uh, delete the, all the preferences and setup key and then re-enter it. For some reason that by default it doesn't ask you for that, it just assumes that, assumes like a blank uh, setup key. So it's under preferences. That's a weird thing and I don't know why it does this. Actually in like system preferences? Or no, in, under, under Globus, the okay. Globus Connect personal. Okay. Are you out there? Okay, can you see my stuff? Where, where should I? Uh, if you search, Okay, um, actually, can I have you share your, can I, if I unshare my screen, can, I, can we show this so people can see what you're doing here? So let me unshare my screen so people in Zoom can see here. I'm gonna stop the share. Go ahead and have you share your, oh, you're not on Zoom. Let's, let's have you join the Zoom room here. US. Mm -hmm. Uh, zoom.us slash j slash what's the my room here Oops. you find my meeting notes here nope wrong one enter the bay of cat uh, ksu.zoom.us They have work to do on their UI. Okay. Uh, zero one six five four two. Is it running? I don't see it down here. Oh, there it is. It's going. Okay, now you're in. So let's share your screen here so we can see what's. There we go. So, so I'm on somebody else's computer, computer here. You can see what he's got. And now we're going to go to endpoint. And we're going to search for. Okay. There's this, and now shares. You do not have any point here. here. I think, I think we, we can do a search. search. You can tell I haven't done this a whole lot. Shared with you.
Kyle's demo. There we are. By knowing the name for it, Kyle shared demo files. And I can open that. And now you see, you can see there, you can see my file that I shared with the entire world. Now you did have to go search for it. So you have to have kind of know the name. But he does have it out there. Somebody's got a question in the chat here. Let's look real quick. What are you asking about, RB? Um, if you're, if you're, whatever files you're transferring now, it will be confined for uh, that duration of that key. Uh, if you're wanting to do more files like tomorrow, that's after. Leave it up for a second. So, so you'll see in Zoom and you can get here. At least I didn't knock the whole microphone, microphone on the ground like I did last time. Sorry. All right. That's not great. Okay. But he, you can see that he can see my files. I already saw Kyle's demo shared file. That's what I'm looking for. Gotcha. So now, if you're anybody but Dave, you'll be able to see those files, but you won't be able to write to my directory. Dave, on the other hand, will be able to write to my directory because, because I gave him permission to do so. So that, that is the on-campus ETN. The off-campus one is very similar, with one exception, that it is, it doesn't give you the defaults when you uh, you can do it with screen. I'll share them again. There's a major echo going on. Somebody oh, I bet that was over, over here. I bet. I bet. I, I, I know what's going on here. We need to mute yours. Matter of fact, we'll, we'll just leave here. It. We don't, we don't need to have you in the Zoom more. There, does that fix it? Great. Thank you for letting me know. I didn't even think about that. So now if you're willing to transfer that, it fix it. Great transfer ascend. Choose each other collections. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. This one again. Secure files. There also is a link for sharing. So you could actually send that to somebody. Uh, send somebody just by email. It's just a matter of fact. It looks like this. So it's a big, long, long uh, URL, but it's something you can actually go to a web browser and, and, and people can get into it that way. So now I'm gonna go back to the overview again, and I've decided I don't want to have people doing this anymore, so I'm going to say delete endpoint. And now it's no longer shared. So I'm going to go through the other one, and you're going to see it's very similar, but not exactly the same. So back to my endpoints. I'm going to, again, I, I'm going to go ahead and search just because you guys won't see it up there. Click on Fiona. Again, this is the one that sits outside the campus firewall. And here, everything has to, if I, I, there is no option over here to view it in the file manager because it doesn't know what you want to look at first. So even if I wanted to grab my own files from off campus, if I wanted to use this, uh, the, this off campus DTN, I would want to go to collections and I'm gonna create a collection just for myself. So I'm going to add a collection.
and I want to sign in again because now that I'm on a different node, it doesn't realize it was the same one. Let me see if I can stand up without knocking my microphone off this time. Ah, it still knew that I was on single sign-on, so kick me over. Base directory. So my base directory is going to be slash home slash Kyle Hudson. And I have to give it a name. Kyle's home directory. And now I can create that co collection. So there was no way of just getting into my own home directory. So I have to do this myself first. It gives me options. Do I want to share this? My home directory? No, I don't want to share this with anybody. I just want this one just to be for me. Transfer data to or from. There we go. So now it's kind of a, now I'm, I'm back into my file manager like I had before. And I can select a collection over here of my 39.9 room display if I want. And again, you can see that I have the same, same kind of setup as we had before. The big difference is there is no default of a home directory on this one. So you actually have to create your own collection of a home directory. If you're sharing things with an outside company, and I know we have at least one researcher on campus that is doing this, they, are, uh, they have a vendor they're sharing lots of files back and forth with. So they're setting up, setting up something out, not out of their home directory, but out of bulk. And they have a writable folder by people in that, in that company. So those people can log in, they can transfer files over for them to process their, their uh, genomics files in this particular case. Uh, what's chat? You got... Gotta love it when it pops down and says, hey, you have something, and then never mind, chat. Endpoint permission denied. I have never seen that. Um, uh, RB, why don't you email me a screenshot? Just send it to the Bayocat at cs.ksu.edu. Uh, I'm leaving right after this class here today, but uh, I'll get to that and I'll take a look at that because that shouldn't be the case as long as you're on Bayocat's Fiona. Um, there is a nice feature here called groups. I don't have any groups set up right now. Um, but I can create a group and I can make this people that are in my lab. So I can create a group of, let's see, here's Bayocat staff. And I can make myself the administrator, fine. Uh, view by group members only. Creating the group, I'm going to invite others and I'm put Dave Turner, KSU.edu, and send another uh, and now we have I have this group, so I'm done. Now, when I go to create my collection here, uh, it's okay. This is really annoying to me that you have to do this every time. Fiona. When I create a collection uh, in my shared folders, even though I shared the other one through the DTN, that doesn't make necessarily mean it's shared through these. They don't talk to each other. So if I create a shared folder on one, it doesn't necessarily know the same shared folders over somewhere else. But I can say Holmes Kyle Hudson slash shared. Ah. What, I, what capitalization did I put on there? Shared hyphen files. Uh, 
demo for groups. I can create that collection. Now, when I go to share this with others, I can say, add permissions, and I can now share this with a group. And I have that group of Baocat staff. If you have people that you're sharing different things with, that can be really convenient to keep it as a group because as somebody leaves the group, you can kick them out. If you add more people to the group, you can let them in, that kind of thing. So that's a, a, a convenient way of doing this type of thing. You can also make other people, as you saw in the group, an administrator on that group. So I could, if we had share files we were sharing with the three of us, I could say any of the three of us, we trust each other, we can make each other administrators, they can add more people, we can, you know, take people off, that kind of thing. So that is Globus in a nutshell. Yes, Dave. Do we have any of this in our documentation? Yes, we do. As of last, as of this week, we have it in our documentation because I finally got the, all everything working this week and, and a demo made. So thank you for asking. He, see, he says that because there was a stub for a long time says, Kyle's going to put something here. And just this week, that, that was changed. So like Monday, I think it was, I got that all going. And it doesn't say that anymore. So I surprised him. So now I'm going to go over here, overview, and I'm going to delete that. Because I don't need it anymore. If you're gonna set up one for your, for your home directory, you might as well just leave it that way though. If you're gonna set up uh, files just for yourself, it makes no sense to create it and then delete it and create it, transfer files and delete it. Just leave it once you make one. There's the files that have gone on to here. Groups, let's see, 39.9 room display, do I have? I'm done with this, so I can delete this endpoint and I will no longer be able to transfer files back and forth to this desktop. So even though Globus is actually running here, it's not doing any good and it won't actually, so I'm gonna go ahead and quit that. Questions? Yes? So why not using Uh huh. Okay, the question was, he was using, he's now using WinSCP and wants to know if it makes sense to move over to Globus. That's largely a function of how big your data sets are. So if you're, if, if you're able to click, you know, send those files over and it's a reasonable period of time, you know, a couple minutes or whatever, leave it. It, don't, it doesn't hurt a thing. If you're transferring large files and you're like, man, this is taking forever, probably go ahead and switch to Globus. There's nothing wrong with either one of those. All right, what else do we have to talk about here? Let me look at my notes. Uh, managing files and storage, and I'm gonna probably share the mic with Dave here a little bit on this, um, and archive options. So I'm gonna give you kind of a, and I don't even have any slides on this, I probably should have, but we have, Several, several, pool, several pools of data on Baocat. Just tell me, uh, that's everybody's stuff and I don't need to know all that. There we are at the top. These are what we have mounted on Baocat right now through Ceph. Ceph is our main file system and it says, you can see we 3.2 petabytes and 1.3 petabytes available, use 2.0. That's all in terms of raw storage. Um, these, there are some differences here in the way these are handled, and I'm gonna tell you about them. Uh, the first is 
the homes volume. This is when you first log in, your stuff is under homes. My name is, yeah, mine's homes Kyle Hudson. That's my home directory. When I write data there, the backend files file storage, we when we if you guys went on the tour yesterday, you noticed there or Tuesday, you noticed there were like 28 servers of just of machines that are talking to hard drives. 29 now, sorry, 29. Forgot we added one just a few weeks ago. And those are meant to be such that any one of those whole machines can go away and everything else keeps running. It's not even just a individual hard drive. It's one of those whole machines go, go away. The way that does that is on homes, it actually writes that data three times. It writes one to this machine, one to this machine, one runs once to this machine. Yes? Yeah. Okay, yep, we can do that. Okay. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, guys. You're fine. Um, so it makes three, three copies of your data. In terms of data resilience, that makes a lot of sense. In terms of space used, obviously, you know, three copies may be a little overkill, but this is the stuff we want to be extra special, sure that nothing goes away from, because this is where most people keep most of their stuff. The, the nice part about that also is that it's fast. When it writes that and reads, it can read, read from that really quickly, it can write to that quickly. So that's the advantage there. The bulk, uh, actually let's go, let's skip one more. Let's go to Scratch. If you want to, you can write anything to Scratch. Okay. It, it's going though, isn't it? Yeah. Doesn't sound like it. Okay, I didn't ever hear it cut. Oh, and it, and it clears, just heard it cover there. Okay. Um, and scratch, scratch. The idea of scratch is to be as fast as possible. So we have we only have it replicate twice instead of once. We still have some data resilience. So if the small little hiccups won't cause everything to go away but we only replicate it twice. Limitations. For the homes volume, we limit you to one terabyte of data. That get, does get backed up. According to our official policies, it still is not being backed up, right? According to our official policies. In actuality, we're, we're backing that up. We're backing it up to our old cluster over in Nichols. As long as it's under a terabyte. As long as under terabyte. We have no way at this point of saying thou shalt not use more than one terabyte. Okay. Right? No, we do. We, do. We, we, we have hard quotas at two terabytes. At two terabytes, okay. If you're using more than a terabyte, not only will your data not be backed up, but you'll probably be getting emails from people saying, hey, you're using too much. Move it. Go somewhere else. The somewhere else at this point is bulk. Bulk is actually uses erasure coding. Erasure coding is where it splits the data up into chunks. And it's four and two, is that what it is now? Is uh, six and three? I think it's six and two. Six and two? Yeah. So it'll take your every uh, megabyte of data that you have there, it'll split that into six chunks, write that out on a different disk, write those little pieces on the different disks. Then it writes some checksum information to another disk and it writes more checksum information to another disk. So it's actually using about one and a half times for every megabyte. So it'll write one and a half megabytes for every megabyte you use. That's a lot better than three. That's using half as much space. So if you say something on bulk, it actually uses half as much space as when you put it on homes. It's not quite as fast because of the, all that processing and has to read all those places when it comes back. It is not quite as fast. It's very comparable on big files. When you start writing, the, we, when we first set Bayocat up with this file system, we put everything in, 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 in that same erasure coded pool. And, and what we found is that in our testing, it worked great. Whenever we act, hit real life, 
when everybody first logs in, when you first log in, it reads and writes a whole bunch of small little files, and that would take, make things take forever, and it was slowing everybody down. So that's why I moved everybody off of that and onto the current homes volume with, with, with a replication instead of on erasure coded. Does erasure coding make sense to people? Am I getting blank looks? It's kind of like RAID systems on a single computer, but it's over multiple computers. So it's, it's some, some level of resilience, not quite as fast is the short version. Starting January, I believe, there we are going to start charging for data in bulk. That still doesn't get backed up, but that's just, so basically we have people that have over 100 terabytes out there in bulk, which is fine. We wanna have places for people to do that, but we can't, we can't fund that ourselves indefinitely. So our file, system, file servers, uh, most of them are getting to be about four years old. They're starting to hit that edge where they're getting old and gonna to need to be replaced. We got a grant to buy it to begin with. That grant's not coming up to be able to do that again. So we're gonna to have to start charging for, for data out there. We, are, we have no plans to charge for home. So if you're under a terabyte, you're fine. If you're on bulk, you're fine. On Scratch, we don't have a limit, but anything that's left over 30 days gets deleted automatically. So don't leave your stuff out there for long if you value your data. And also if things happen to go you know, haywire, we might reformat it and just take over, start over again on Scratch. There's no promises on that. So that, that is meant for short-term files, write your stuff out there, you know, intermediate files, your jobs use in the middle, and then copy your final results over, delete your, delete your stuff off Scratch, because it gets deleted anyway. So basically no guarantees of anything. Nope, no, not on those. It just, it just does it. So, like I say, don't, don't put things out there that you plan on, plan to be out there for a very long time. As long as they're actively being used, they will stay. Right. If they actively oh, being used. Okay. Right. Yeah, so yeah they're, we're actually looking at date stamps. Yeah, on. Look at the modification date stamps. And if it's something that you are using, you can use it like a touch command to uh, keep the modification. Don't even need to do that. We look at the access times. Oh, the access times. So as long as it's been read. At any point in time in the last 30 days. Well, then the modification will help with that. Yeah. So copy it to somewhere. <laughs> even if you don't, even if you throw it away when you're done, copy the dev null. <laughs> That'll access it. That is the, uh, that is what we have right now for storage. This one's different. Th this is all for internal use, the Bayou Cat. So Scratch, Bulk, and Homes are the places that you guys can save data. And everybody has a bulk directory, slash bulk, slash EID. So I've got one here. You see I have several files out there, myself in bulk. But, uh, so you, you already have that available. You can copy stuff out there. There will be a per terabyte charge starting next year. Not yet, but there will be. I think what we're talking about, $50 a terabyte per year, something like that. So it's not, it's not a ridiculous charge. It's basically just enough to pay for our hard drives is really all it is. Um, archiving. We have... It, we have hardware in place to basically do the same thing for archive storage. That will be a matter of talking to Dan and getting, uh, getting that set up. We're, we're ready to go on that, right? Pretty much, we just need to set up the JBODs for it. That's what I'm going, I'm going there. So 
We have a couple of, of options also for, uh, for archiving that don't rely on that. The first one is free, which I like free, but it requires some steps to go through. And that is Google Drive. If I sign into Google Drive, now, in order to do this though, here's the magic, is that if you're wanting to use more than the default 15 gigs, you have to get your account blessed by central IT. So you have to send, you, because they don't set up accounts for everybody by default, because they don't want people using the Google services for education for some reason, they're afraid they're like gonna supplant the Microsoft stuff they have out there. Uh, Microsoft has one drive that has uh, data you can transfer up to a terabyte to that. So you can do that from your desktop for up to a terabyte. Bigger than that, that doesn't work so well. So contact us, we'll tell you how to get a hold of this to, to get the right people to talk to at Central IT. And we can't, we can't do it for you. So we, we, we can just tell you the right place to ask. So I'm going to sign in. What's that? On, on Google Drive, it's unlimited. Unlimited. Yeah, okay. there, is, there is no limit on Google Drive. So, and it has to be at the ksu.edu. That's how it knows it's an education. That, that's why it's unlimited, because it's an educational account. So it has to be your KSU edu email. Next. No. So here's my Google Drive right now, and I have a couple of files out there. And there is one called Archives. And here is, the, I, I am using this to, we are using this to copy stuff that people who have left the university. So if we look here, uh, this person left the university at some point uh, we archived this on 2016, 11, 29. So in November, 2016, we archived this. We then uploaded this to Google Drive. And you can see I have 19 terabytes used in Google Drive right now. There is a, by using that Fiona node, um, we have a, that very fast connection to the outside world and we can upload files. There, there is a command, it's all called rclone that we will help you. We will help you set it up when, when you get to that point. But if you want to archive stuff to Google Drive, that's probably the best way of doing it in the short term. Long term, um, the University of Oklahoma is setting up a monstrous research tape archive. And what you'll do with them is you will buy for every. Uh, you will buy actually two tapes like physical cartridges, the LTO 8 now, is that what it is? Whatever, whatever version, the LTO 9, they're tape cartridges. And you buy two of them and you send them to University of Oklahoma. Actually, I think you'd write a check to them and they buy it for you. But then they will have, make two backup copies. We, we don't have this set up yet, but there's gonna be a way that we copy our files down to there. They put backup copies onto tape. They keep one copy there for retrieval purposes, they send you the other copy to you. So you can, you can actually, uh, if, if something goes away with their system or whatever, that's their assurance that you've still got a copy of your data around. That probably won't be operational until next summer. That's probably the best long-term solution because the cost of tape is peanuts on a per terabyte basis. But, so that, that'll be a very inexpensive solution permanent more or less with the cartridges you have, but it's not ready yet. So that's, that's, the, that's the downside. Those are kind of options for archiving data at this point. The nice part about uh, using Google Drive though, is as of with everything else with Google Drive, let's say that this person contacts us and say, hey, I had this stuff back there way back once upon a time. I can share it with them over Google Drive and they have access to it. So that make, that, that's actually pretty nice with that as opposed to any, any of the other solutions that out there 
is that there's kind of that instantaneous, yeah, let me share that with you. Any questions? No, uh, he asked if, you, if we can connect that through Globus. Globus has a connector to Google Drive, but they want like $3,000 a year for it. So we're not doing that. <laughs> if, you, yeah, if your research group wants to buy it for us for the, yes, we'll, we'll happily make, add that onto our Globus subscription. Yes, we've, we've been using our clone to copy up and down. Oh, there is, yeah, there is, uh, to Google Drive, there is a daily transfer limit of 750 gigabytes, which we I actually hit that when I was uploading all this stuff. So if you're, if you're transferring, you know, uh, lots and lots of data, it has to, you have to break it up into that size. Um, and it also has a five terabyte per file limit. So you can't have any individual files larger than five terabytes for all of you that have files larger than five terabytes. I don't know if we have anybody has any files larger than five terabytes that's not already an archive that you couldn't break apart anyway, so. So we're ready to forget them. Yeah. So just, just to summarize, uh, the model that uh, used to be operating on is, you know, if you're, you live within a terabyte, that's awesome. If you do use large files, uh, put the large files in bulk. Uh, right now, they're not charged for it, but when you get to the point of them being charged, if that's more, if that's something you can afford, then those files are nice and close to you and very handy. If, if you can't afford the cost, then the options are uh, you could do a one time uh, expenditure to be to buy disks and put them in our archival. Uh, cabinet or you can go free with the Google Drive. It's just a little farther away from bail cap. So you have to jump a little bit more Google. And then if you want to use that data, you can bring it down to scratch. You can use it there on a temporary basis. And then when you're done, either delete it or it will be deleted. So there will be other options uh, to what you currently may be using in bulk. That worked out real well time wise since I need to leave. Okay. I need to plug in over there, Dave. And I think there we go. No, that's what wasn't what I meant what I intended to do. Okay.
Um, my name is Adam Tiger. I was gonna. Because uh, you've got your audio turned on. You've got the mic muted. Hello, so can everybody hear me? All right, sounds great. Uh, my name is Adam Tiger. I was going to, I'm going to talk to you about Git today. Um, let me pull up my notes here since I need, I need those. Uh, in, gen in general, uh, what, what we do with uh, what, what Git is uh, version control. It lets you control, it lets you keep track of the changes in something over time. Um, why do we want to use it? Uh, we'd want to use it because um, we, 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 we want to use it just to be sure that uh, if you are making changes to, to your software, that you can get back to a workable state, that you know what's changed, that if, if somebody's collaborating with you, you can see what they changed and make sure and do, uh, do verification that, the, that their changes are good. Um, there are lots of types of it. Uh, Git just happens to be one of the types that we're, the, the, the type that we're going to be going over. Uh, it seems to be more and more of the industry standard. Um, there are things like SVN, CVS, uh, Microsoft has one built into Visual Studio. I have no idea what it is, but you know there are lots of different types of version control. Um, it gets uh, history. Uh, Git was invented in 2005 um, by uh, Linus Torvalds. Um, he, he was using a, a, a piece of software called BitKeeper. It was closed source, but they had given him a license to use uh, to use it for for, de for developing the Linux kernel. Um, they it, it had gotten very cumbersome to use on such a large project as the Linux kernel, and it broke. And when it broke, somebody uh, they, they decided they were going to re rewrite it, and Linus ended up rewriting most uh, writing this new version control in like a weekend. That's how frustrated he was with it. Um, all right, so we're going to start by uh, creating a Git repository. Let me clear off the screen here so that people can see what, what's going on. Um, I'm, on I, I'm currently on Baocat, but uh, we're going to create a directory called, you know, I'm going to put my resume in here. Make their resume. You can use it for resumes. You can use it for text files. You can use Git for um, all kinds of different things. but you can use it for source for source control. I think the resume is is, is a perfectly th fine thing to do. Um, so I've just created a folder. There's nothing special about it yet. And to create that initial repository, we're going to do a, a git init. That initialized an empty git repository right here in my home directory or in my in my source resume resume directory. Um, you know, I can do a I can do a directory listing. So there's nothing in there yet. Uh, it shows that it actually did create a .git folder when I initialized it. Um, you uh, you you can uh, you can start creating files with say say I can maybe start creating my uh, biography. So vim bio. I'm gonna 
say my name is uh, name Adam Tiger. Uh, likes. Um, I like computers. Um, I like uh, video games. I like nature. I've now written that file. We can cat it, bio. And now we've got this repo. Uh, does Git know anything about it? I don't think so. We can, we can check that with a Git status. That lets us see what the status is of the current directory. Okay, it tells me that we're on a branch called master. We, we got an initial commit. There's nothing there yet, so there was the initial commit. We've got untracked files. And it's in red here. Bio is untracked. We go through and say, okay, well, we want to track this file. These are, these, this is a file that might have changes that we want saved and, are, and, and, and kept track of. So we do a git add. It says right here, git add file. So we're going to do a git add bio. We can check the status again, see what's going on. It says, oh, well, we've got a new file. And we've now, since we've added it, we've not told Git to actually commit this, to keep, it, keep track of it yet. So we're going to do a git commit. We say git commit, it commits all files that have been added. They have to be added for, for Git to actually keep track of the changes in it. And it brought up a little text, uh, it, brought, it brought up my, uh, my editor here with, uh, please enter the commit message for your changes. What would you want to do with the commit message? Um, in general, in, a, in, a, in any commit message, you want to you want to list the things you did. Why why did you make those changes? Um, at least the first line you want to keep keep, keep uh, short and sweet. But we're gonna say we added bio, uh, my name, and likes. So since that's the commit we've added, we can we can save it, and it then tells me that. We've added bio and one file changed, three insertions. So it, it, it inserted three lines. Now, if I come in here and say, if I take a look at my bio again, and I decide that, you know what? I've changed, I've, I've gotten older. I'm not sure I like video games anymore. Maybe, maybe I want those to be board games. I can save that file and Git comes in here and I say git status and we've got a modified file now. What did I change again? Git diff. Well, I, that shows a difference between what was committed last and what is currently in the state. So it says that, well, we changed this line. My likes changed from video games to board games. Maybe, you know what, maybe I still like video games. Do I really like board games? I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna change my mind on that. I'm going to get checkout bio. That pulls back bio from, the, uh, from what was previously checked in. It reset its state back to, back, back to, back to what it was before. So if we do a git diff, there are no differences. If we actually look at bio again, it shows that I still like video games. So a checkout allows you to re reset your state on individual files back to, uh, back to uh, what was previously commit. Um, what if I've come back to a repository I forgot what was going on what, uh, that I haven't been looking at in a while? I'd want to see what the log was, what's happened. And this repository is fairly small, so the log's not particularly interesting. And it tells me that hey, I added my bio and names and likes, and my author is me. I mean, it was created not too long ago. So it's a relatively short log, but if I went to something like Another repository, real quick, that I that, that I happen to to use. I want my Slurm repository. 
I take a look at the log there. The log is thousands and thousands and thousands of lines long, each with a commit ID, an author, uh, the date it was committed, and the actual messages that they put in there so you could figure out what they were trying to do. Um, We'll go back to the resume. Let's uh, let's go ahead and make those changes again to uh, to to my bio. I, I you know what? I I think I'm going to add I'm going to add video games to my bio to my likes or a bit of video games board games. So I'll add that to the end and dislikes. Angry bees. I dislike angry bees. So we can take a look and see what we changed again. Get diff. And, well, I'm ready to commit this, so let's do that. Get commit. But wait, there's nothing ready to commit. There's, there's a file modified, but we forgot to add it. Every time you make a change to a file that you actually want to make to be committed, you have to tell Git that, you know, I actually want you to keep track of these new changes. So we do a git add again. And now we can commit. And it says, all right, we've modified bio. And what did I do? I added, uh, added, added board games. Likes. Added dislikes. OK. So if we check the log again, it shows that, hey, we've got two commit messages now. One that one with our initial commit and one with our new one. If we do a git diff, a git status, there's nothing to commit, everything's ready, everything's clean. But I forgot what I did. I I know I made changes here. What happened? Do, do, what, what actually changed between these two commits? We can actually do a diff between head and head minus one. So that basically says where you're at now, what was the difference between now and one revision back? So that is what a git diff, that, that is, so this head is a magical keyword. That is, that's the beginning, that, that, that's the current release of, uh, of the git repository. And minus one, or this tilde one, says one revision back. You could do things like uh, tilde two. Um, but because, tilde? you can, I can't remember the syntax for that right now. <laughs> um, the other things you can do is with your git log, you've got your diffs, or you've got your commit messages idea here. You can do a git diff, commit message, or the, the commit ID, and it will show you differences between now and that commit. So we made these changes. We added board games and angry beats. Yes. And then how does that, like, what would you have, like, a live file? Um, or, like, what would you write in your message if you have a live file? Well, so there, there, are a few, there are a few schools of thoughts on commit messages in general. Um, what I try and do is I try and make sure that whatever my commits are, when I make commits, I will, uh, I'll make a commit that is that is self-contained. So if I'm so really this this last this last commit I made, board adding board games and dislikes, they're not really it's not really self-contained. It, it it's changing two different things. Either one of those could be could be a change in and of itself. Um, one of the things that you that you that you can do with uh, with Git is you can commit individual files. So if you when you, you Git add. You, you can just commit an image files. Um, 
the other thing that git can do uh, oh let's see what I want is uh, you can you can add individual lines to um, to the staging area the, the staging area, for those that don't know, is, is um, it, it, Git has, has a concept of now, what was before, and things that are going to be committed, and things that are going to be committed are in the staging area. Um, my editor here, I've got plugins that, that let me do this easily. Um, I know there are also plugins for it with uh, Google, with uh, Visual Studio Code, and um, GitHub has a has a GUI to do some of this stuff. Um, I'm going to edit my bio again, and I'm going to say uh, I'm going to remove board games because you know, I don't really like it. I'm going to add another dislike of um, stormy seas. So I've, I've made those changes. Uh, my editor, I could just do a G diff, and that shows me the diffs, di the, 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 the diff between um, the staging area and what's, cur what's currently there. Um, uh, let's see. And so what I can do is I can just say diff obtain, and I can just save that. And now if we take a look at We've got, so I've just changed one thing in the staging area. If we do a git diff, it looks like we just, we, we still have stormy seas changed, but we're not ready to commit that yet. And we've got a modified of both bio that's ready to be committed and a modified of bio that's not ready to be committed. Um, I'm doing it on the command line for indiv staging individual lines is kind of a pain in the butt. I know you can do it, but I haven't done that in a long time. Um, what editor are you, do you usually use, or are you? I'm like, I'm just worried about that. Okay. I just okay. started uh, like this week and I'm thinking like, if you have more than one file, like, or is it so, personal So it is personal preference. Yeah. Um, if you're wanting to, if you want to be able to revert changes or if you have, if you're working with somebody else and you've got a gigantic changes and every cha every time you're changing five different things, trying to figure out what broke between different rever revisions is kind of a pain if you're if you're changing everything in every commit. Okay. So, in general, I say try and keep them smaller. But uh, you can just add all the files and just say, "Yay, this was a roll up of everything." <laughs> yeah. You mentioned multiple files. If you're doing the same thing to all the files then doing them in one commit is a good idea. Right. So if you're changing, if you're changing one function name, but you're changing it in six files, that's very appropriate to do right. one commit with one uh, uh, message on what you're changing. Yep. Okay. Right. So I'm going to, uh, I decided that, you know what, I'm not ready to, uh, to make those changes that I just made. So I'm going to re get reset head to, un, to undo, undo the changes that I made to bio. And I can get diff. And now it's showing me all the changes. And I'm going to get checkout bio to completely reset back to whatever state I was at. So now I'm just back to liking computers, video games, nature, and board games, and just liking bees. Um, now, with Git, you can do things like have remotes. Uh, you might not, this repository that we just created is on Beocat, and it's just on Beocat. Um, if I want to collaborate with somebody, that's kind of a pain, and they'd have to have access to my, to my Git repository here, and I wouldn't really want that. So a lot of times what you do is you set up a remote. And we have no remotes here, but I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the browser. 
Uh, we're going to go to gitlab.payocat.ksu.edu. Let me stop the share, reshare. Reshare GitLab. So I'm logged into I'm, I'm logged into GitLab now. Everybody that has a Bayocat account has access to GitLab. If you don't have a Bayocat account, you can get you you can just add you can just create an account on GitLab. But um, it and GitHub are are basically just centralized places to store your repositories. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the benefits of one or the other. Uh, GitLab, you can have unlimited private repositories because it's all on Bayocat. Uh, the, the, the downside is that it's all associated with Bayocat, and that means that if, if you're wanting it in a more centralized location, or you want to share with a lot of outside collaborators or whatever, you might want that on GitHub. GitHub has other functionality as well, but uh, GitLab works well for everything we want to do. So I've just said uh, create a new project on GitLab and I'm going to name my project resume. It's because that was what we were working on before. I don't really want my resume to be pub public right now. So I'm going to set the vi visibility level to private. I'm not going to initialize any repositories yet. And, and, you know, no, need, no need for read me. So I'm just going to create that, create that project. And just like on GitHub, it tells you, hey, the repository is empty. What are you going to do? You can create a new repository and push it up. You can push an existing folder. Or you can uh, push an existing Git repository. And that's what we were actually going to do. It's because we just made that Git, uh, that, uh, that, uh, Git resume. We're going to add origin uh, for, for GitLab. And we're going to push that up. Reshare. So now we can come in here and say git remote add uh, origin SSH git at Bayocat, you know, all, 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 everything that GitLab told you to use. And we add that remote. We can do a git remote dash v to actually show that it, it created that. And we can go ahead and do something like a git push. Oh wait, no, we can't because we haven't told the, uh, git that uh, its upstream uh, branch is master as well. Do that, we enter our password or our keys, whatever we need to do. It pushes up to, to GitLab. And in the browser here, we can refresh. And it tells me, hey, we've got a repository. We can check our history like we were doing before. It tells you that you had, that I had this bio and that I added board games to my likes and dislikes. And you can take a look at the diffs of the, uh, of, of, of the history and that kind of stuff by clicking on the actual report, history name, a commit message. Um, GitLab even has a uh, has a rudimentary file editor, so we can go in here and say, you know what, we're going to edit this, and I can edit it right here. Um, I decided that you know what, in my bio, I should really have an address in there. I'm going to put in my uh, my address. And we're going to call that uh, uh, 2221 uh, B Engineering Hall. Manhattan, Kansas, 66506. And you know what? I'm going to, uh, my commit message right here, I'm going to say I uh, added my address. And let's save that. Uh, 
So now if we take a look at the repository, at the, the, the file now, it says that, hey, we've got my address in there. And you know what? We've got a remote now and I, I, I needed to go home and I was working on, on this, this bio at home too and I forgot what I put in there. So I'm now working at home. I'm gonna edit my bio as well. So it says we're both working on it and I'm gonna say, you know what? My address is one, two, three, four, Fig Street. Just get add that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get commit that. Put in my message, added address. Now, we have, a, we have this repository that's pushed up to GitLab. It's got one file on there. And there's a different set of files on my computer home here. That then they bo they've both been changed. That's not really a good thing. We can do a git pull, try and let's, let's pull the changes from GitLab from the centralized repository. Oh no, there, there's, there's been a conflict. What, well, what happened here? Let's, let's take a look. Oh, well, we got the bio, bio file. Let's, uh, let's edit it and take a look. Let's see what happened. Oh no, they, they both got changed. They both got pulled in. It tells you right here at head, that's what's, on the local on your current repository and this other one over here with these other arrows after the equals is what was on the remote end well which 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 we keep in general you know you, you'd go through in these these checks and make sure that you only keep the ones that actually make sense and now that i've made those messages i can do uh, I can do a git status. It's showing that things have, things have changed. I can do a git diff. And it shows me that, all right, well, now we've made these changes. We're ready to, we, 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 we've made the changes uh, <coughs> so we can fix what was up, what was upstream. And we're going to git commit that. Oh, I forgot to add it. Even I forget to do this stuff sometimes. Okay, and now we're going to say, save that commit message. <coughs> if I can actually type. It shows that we, uh, we merged in a branch. We can push that, those changes back upstream. Nothing should ever, not, nothing should have changed up there, really. And that's about all I've got, that's about all I've got for that. Um, you can create branches within Git to keep, to keep your, your, your settings, you keep, to keep your feature releases uh, changed uh, so you keep a clean master and everything works there. Um, you can add things like uh, readme files and I think I'm not sharing my browser right now. You can, add, you can create readme files, you can just type those in right here and you'd add those to the repository. You'd, uh, you, you can create um, contribution messages, uh, licenses. Licenses are always a good thing to keep in your, uh, in your Git repository, because if you don't have your code licensed, nobody in their right mind will touch it. But still, people might touch it. <laughs> if, if you use the wrong license, people might be able to take your ideas and not credit you and sell it. Um, in general, if you're making things public, you should make sure that you have a good license set. I would use something either it, I, I would use something like uh, the GPL or a BSD license or Creative Commons. If you're not a lawyer, don't write your own license because the, that that lawyers lawyers know how to tear them apart. 
So that's about all I've got there for Git. Any questions? Uh, yeah, we were making a recording of it. Yep. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, since that's all we got for Git, I'm going to go ahead and let Dave take over. And oh, that was it. Okay, that was it. Guess we're done. Just thank everyone. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, and if you do have more questions over Git, there's a lot of tutorials out there. Absolutely, so and I, I know like I, 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 I went fairly quick with a lot of these things, but oh well, we can, we can certainly talk more about it. Uh, question is, where can we find the recorded sessions from Tuesday as well as today? Uh, recorded sessions will be uh, available on our website uh, as soon as we get them edited and thrown up on YouTube. They'll be under our training videos set, uh, section. So Kyle should have an email of everyone who participated. So we can have him send out a link to that as well. Yeah, thanks for coming, guys. Okay, um, we have we have open support sessions every uh, Wednesday, uh, almost every Wednesday. On our uh, on our website, we have a calendar, uh, uh, support.bayocat.ca.edu. Uh, we got a Google calendar down there, and it basically tells you where the uh, when the support session is. They're they're Wednesdays at one thirty, uh, and then where what room in the union we're in. Uh, this next You're fine. Wednesday, You're we're going to be in uh, Union 203, and, and that's on our that's on our support board? website. We keep track of these. No. Um, <coughs> we uh, we usually will delete the, we'll, we'll delete the uh, the sessions that we are not going to be able to attend. We try and keep at least one of us there. I know in a couple of weeks we've got one that that we're going to have to delete because we're all going to be on a trip in. Uh, um, down to well, Oklahoma. So people do different things. Um, we, 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 we all try to get there, but we'll have at least, we usually have one, at least one there. Oh, I'm going to oh, have to delete so, the... So if you want, you can go to my bin directory. Yep. All right. I and, just, uh, I just removed uh, one for the, uh, this is a for September 25th, so you can steal because it from there if you want. we're not going to be there. What a lot of people do is, so, okay. A lot of people do that. Because uh, LL is right. so like, you might have license. Like, can I just pull a license? And you can put this at the end of the like like you, you do not need to install the whole software. software. Uh, uh, so so the license that you've got, is it for a license server or? It's not a full server. And so actually, I um, install that on So a lot of people, at the end of their bash.c file, will put aliases. I need to get a license.